uh, welcome to everybody, uh, everybody who's here uh, and the online audience uh, that we also have with us uh, for this Lionel Robbins Memorial Lecture. So I'm Richard Layard. Um, I'm the uh, co-director of the Community Wellbeing Programme in the LSE's uh, Centre for Economic Performance. But uh, many, many decades ago, I had the, uh, the great privilege of working with Lionel Robbins on the Robbins Report, which is uh, probably why I'm standing up here. Uh, it's wonderful that we have Mariana uh, to speak to us. I first came to know of uh, your work, Mariana, uh, when I read your wonderful book on the entrepreneurial state in, in 2013, and from which I discovered, as those of you who've read it will know, that almost everything in here, almost everything in here, all the breakthroughs, all the technological breakthroughs um, were made through publicly funded research, which actually influenced me a lot when thinking about climate change as I was at the time uh, and the absolute necessity for major public investment um, in research into clean energy. Um, since that time, 2013, Marianne has written three more books, um, all very influential. Uh, she's now working on another one, uh, focused on public value. She's advised many institutions, many international institutions, including the UN, WHO, and the EU. Still does so. Uh, she's won many prizes, uh, and she's been named as one of the three most important thinkers in the world on innovation. No, just in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell the two. Uh, Marianne is a professor at University College London, uh, where she directs its Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Earlier, she was a student in the US where she earned her PhD, but she then very wisely came to the LSE. Um, and we're delighted that she agreed to give these lectures in memory of Lionel Robbins, who had such a, a, a huge effect on so many of us, including uh, myself. And I'm delighted that we've got uh, some uh, members of the uh, Robbins uh, clan here, especially his daughter Anne. Wonderful to have you with us here. Thank you for coming. So this is the first of two lectures, uh, the second of which has had to be postponed due to strike action. Um, as usual, there'll be a chance uh, for people here in the audience to put questions at the end of the lecture, but online audience members can also submit questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And, and if you do, please also write your name and affiliation. Uh, so, Mariana, uh, we can't wait uh, to hear your first Land Robbins lecture on putting collective value creation at the heart of economic thinking and practice. Thank you. Sorry, we're just letting in the Zoomers. Is that right? Okay. So normally people say, I'm so happy to be here. And I am really happy to be here. I must say that I was a bit torn on how happy because my husband had a film at the Oscars last night and I was supposed to accompany him. He said the Academy, meaning academia, won over the Academy. And I didn't want to cancel. So yeah. <laughs> It's probably the only reason that it's good that he didn't win anything, because then I would have really you know, regretted it. But anyway, anyway. Um, sorry, where's the clicker? Here we go. Um, and the other thing is, and this isn't an excuse, but it's, it's you know, just kind of, we have to go with the flow, because, because there were three well thought out lectures, and due to the union strike, we canceled one and have postponed the other, because it's not really like a class where you have to cancel them in order to withdraw your labor for the strike. We could have chosen any dates. It just happened that it was on the strike date. So we wanted to uh, honor, as we should, the labor movement and the reason that everyone is striking. So we canceled one, but then postponed the other. But then I was left with this hanging, what should be in that first one, in order to also sort of encompass the big thinking that I was going to try to um, encourage us all, including myself, to kind of provoke ourselves to really move beyond a lot of the dichotomies, which I continue to be shocked, still exist out there in terms of how we think about the economy. And I'm going to 
get to that, but just to say that last minute in order to bring in some of the thinking that was going to be in the second and third, I plopped them in here. And because we have a limited time, in fact, I don't know where my phone's gone. Maybe one of my helpers can give me your phone with the timer so I don't go over, thank you so much. Uh, turn it off so I don't get calls from your husband asking where you are. Um, and I do also just wanna say, if this works, it doesn't, I'll let the people, yeah, it's not working. Um, that it, it, it's such an honor to be giving it in memory of Lionel Robbins, who by definition, even though he's known for uh, being kind of semi-free marketeer, he was so much more granular than that. And, and how he talked about universities and the very famous Robbins report was all about governance. How do we actually govern our economy? What is valued? Given, sorry, it's still not moving. Oh, that's the clock. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe this is good because I did flop a lot of slides in there that are too many. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so it's even more of an honor that it's in his honor because the issue of how do we actually govern our economy? The economy is an outcome, it's an outcome of governance decisions within the state. Do we actually still have to be wed to this idea that? Where you click the program, that the state is at best fixing market failures, uh, how do we govern the private sector? Is it really just about shareholder value maximization or at best this fuzzy concept of stakeholder value where then we end up not walking that talk? And what does it actually mean for all these different organizations in the economy? Of course, not just public and private, there's lots of civil society organizations. How do they actually work together? This, cool. Um, so that idea that the economy is an outcome should actually be putting a lot of pressure on, on us, right? All these governance decisions. And I always say that if you speak to any biologists, they don't actually let you be lazy about words like ecosystems, which in my neck of the woods in the economy, we always use the word innovation ecosystems. They'll ask you, what kind of ecosystem? Is it predator prey? Is it parasitic? Is it symbiotic? Is it mutualistic, right? So how do we actually get all these different actors in the economy, including trade unions, given the moment that I just talked about in terms of really strikes all over. On my way here, there was all the doctors and nurses striking. Trade unions themselves can be governed in particular kinds of ways and interact with the economy in a particular kind of way. And uh, where's Richard? You mentioned the iPhone. Where'd you go? There you are. Um, and all the you know, uh, innovation that's in it that was state funded, we shouldn't forget that there's all sorts of social innovations too. The fact that we have the weekend, right? Saturdays and Sundays, not a bad thing, is actually an outcome of the trade union movement actually having fought for that. Um, but trade unions themselves, how they're structured matters. So all these different issues basically should have encouraged us to get rid of all these kind of black and white dichotomous ways of talking about Capitalism versus socialism, uh, privatization versus nationalization. Should we not, you know, renationalize our transport structures because they're actually not working very well? They're not green. They're not very accessible. So there's a debate about that. The more granular discussions about how do we actually govern, perhaps a private system, but that is publicly led. So it's a public-private partnership versus what we actually have often, which are private-public partnerships. Rosie Collington and I talk about this in our book called The Big Con. That's, that's, that's a much more granular kind of question. Uh, market versus state. By the way, this, this word actually doesn't make much sense to put it versus state. It should say business versus the state. That's the dichotomy. The market itself is an outcome of, again, state structures, state interaction. Carl Polanyi, I'm sure you've all read his book, The Great Transformation. He's probably one of the best historians about the evolution of the market and how the so-called free market, which actually has never really existed, but even the notion of the free market and the attempt to have a free market actually only came about with huge amounts of state intervention. Uh, so read The Great Transformation, what was it, 1944? Um, so anyway, these, these kind of old and boring ways to kind of frame the debate. I just did um, Politics Live today. God, uh, anyway, um, again, BBC Politics Lab, where we talk for the first 45 minutes about Lineker. And we should, we can definitely come back to that in a minute. Uh, we about the BBC. And then this whole bottom up or top down and, and um, you know, 
what does that actually mean? You can still have, for example, a strong direction by the state. Think of the moon landing, which I'll talk about later, um, but lots of bottom-up experimentation, right? So the real question is, how do you do that? How do you provide a strong direction? Think of the sustainable development goals, 17 of them since 2015, 169 targets beneath them. That's a direction. We need to solve these goals. Again, 17 that were actually negotiated globally, they didn't just come down from the UN, but those countries that have signed up to them, you could actually argue that governments should set them as a direction top down in the sense, okay, we're gonna go after these. But then the real question, the interesting question is how do we actually foster as much collaboration, collective intelligence, investment, sharing of knowledge, something I'll come back to, back to all these things as you can tell, um, in order to actually foster that experimentation um, and different types of solutions of which some might win and some might not. The internet, which you uh, talked about, Richard, was a solution to a problem. No one said, we want the internet. The internet is great in the way that today, many people talk about things like AI and quantum computing or AI strategies. The internet, like so many different technologies not only came out of public investment, but purpose and problem oriented public investment, right? The question was not, we need the internet. The question was, we got to get the satellites to communicate, right? And the internet was a solution. Same thing with GPS. Not only was it publicly financed, but the real interesting thing was that it was a solution to a problem that the Navy had. Where are all the ships? How do we actually have real control on knowledge about our ocean? So this idea that purpose and problem-oriented kind of uh, goals and designs of policies that can be kind of argued the top down, someone saying, okay, we're going to go after that really difficult problem, but that the question then is how do we galvanize as much experimentation and different types of solutions for that problem and think of it literally as a portfolio, that's that kind of really interesting granular thinking, which unfortunately we don't have. Um, and so again, thank you for, for inviting me to give the lecture in honor of, is it Anna? Anne. Anne? Anne? Hello? <laughs> of your father? Yes? Uh, thank you so much. Um, because actually so many people, oh God, I see that because of the Zoom, you won't see any of the titles, but that's fine. Because as you see, I'm going to talk through most of these slides in ways that have nothing to do with the slides, but um, the Robbins principle of governance. How do we actually govern, for example, public education? How do we value it? How do we make sure it's stable? But also, as Richard was saying, how about all those people also who don't go into higher education? How do we govern the access that everyone actually should have as a human right? We talked about that today around the stop to boats uh, uh, issue. There are human rights around all these different conventions, which today are being illegally, um, I can say anything I want, right? I don't work for the BBC. Uh, <laughs> I'm going against, but do we even have any economics of human rights? Uh, not that I know of, at least not a strong approach to that question. Uh, so some of the kind of broad questions that I was gonna talk about throughout the three uh, lectures, where and how is value created? How is it shared? What's the state's role? Other actors' roles too, but this is one of the most controversial ones, the less theorized one role in innovation and value creation, not just redistribution of the value, not just enabling of the value, not just de-risking someone else's value creation. Do we actually have a complex and granular understanding of the state's role in co-creating and co-shaping the market and the economy? Uh, much of my work has argued no, and that we need one, and I've tried to do my bit, in which capabilities are needed, and what has gone wrong, well, it's not just McKinsey, but that's part of it, <laughs> which is when you don't actually invest in your own capabilities, uh, what happens, you slowly become infantilized. What Lord Agnew, one of the uh, uh, lords, one of your colleagues, Richard, uh, argued that after uh, COVID and Brexit on the back of all the funds that were transpiring that the UK government, but many governments globally, have been spending on consultants. He said, what are we doing? We are infantilizing Whitehall. What does that say? Stay by the. Okay, as long as it didn't say your fly is undone or something. Okay. <laughs> stay by what? Here? Yeah. Why? I'm Italian. I got to move. Okay, I'll stay. I'll stay. I'll try. Got it. Um, 
Um, yeah, so what capabilities are needed? We have all sorts of interesting thinking about the private sector, right? So there's business schools where managers are trained. The courses sound really cool. You can tell me if they're cool, if anyone here goes to a business school, but strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. There's books written about this. Uh, a colleague uh, at, at Charles Baden Fuller once wrote a book called uh, Rejuvenating the Mature Corporation. Why? Because we know that when companies get big, they might get lethargic, too bureaucratic, so we got to rejuvenate them. Whereas when governments are big, we just say, oh, the bureaucracy, right? So bureaucratic almost by definition becomes a negative word, as opposed to, again, in a granular way, in a complex way, asking the difficult questions, how do you rejuvenate a government bureaucracy? How do you rejuvenate any bureaucracy? Again, trade unions have to be rejuvenated. The labor movement, the movement, if we actually have a movement that requires rejuvenation. So it's not just, you know, either a party, the labor party or labor union, the labor side has always in the past been movement that of course itself requires thinking about intra organizational capabilities for a movement. Um, and how can we direct our economy towards a public purpose? I set up a whole institute at UCL called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. My co-directors here, Reiner Cattell, my wonderful PhD student, Rosie Collington, who I've just written a book with called The Big Con is here. That whole idea of if any of this makes any sense, what I'm talking about, that's about building a purpose-oriented economy, not just purpose in business, purpose in government, purpose in all these other actors in civil society, and how do they actually work together to generate the kind of outcomes that in theory we want. Why in theory? Because we talk a lot about these things like inclusive growth, sustainable growth, climate change, the SDGs. I don't know anyone who's ever said, I don't like innovation, no innovation, or actually some people do say, I don't care about the climate, but you know, we, lots of people in this room amongst the intelligentsia, but also non-intelligentsia talk about climate change a lot. And yet we're not actually at speed finding the solution. So what does that actually mean? Is it just by coincidence that we're not moving at pace, that there's lots of blah, blah, blah? Or is it that almost by design we're failing because we've thought about the role of different types of organizations, including in the private sector in very problematic ways? Um, and COVID should have been a wake up call, right? Because we failed massively. The vaccine was not the goal. <laughs> vaccinating the world was the goal because it's a global pandemic. So even just from purely opportunistic reasons, we should have cared to vaccinate the world, let alone for humanistic reasons, we failed. So Dr. Tedros, who I work with, um, he's the head of the World Health Organization, calls this vaccine apartheid and the vaccine nationalism that we saw, but also the very problematic way that we continue to govern innovation systems so that patents, intellectual property rights are way too strong, way too wide, way too upstream. So the process by which we're innovating is actually causing a lot of rent extraction, value extraction, and actually hurting the kind of learning and shared intelligence that at least during a global pandemic, we should have you know, worked towards um, so that we didn't have to rely on vaccines just being shipped from one part of the world to another, but that they could actually be produced globally that local capacity development actually requires sharing the knowledge. Uh, we also failed though massively in all sorts of other things with COVID, um, the digital divide. So, you know, lots of kids globally locked down, stopped accessing their human right to education. Um, uh, test and trace in this country was actually quite a failure. The vaccine rollout was a, actually a huge success. It was distributed through a decentralized network of GP practices and the National Health Service. And it was you know, applauded. Are we today investing more in the NHS and that distributed network of GP practices? No, so that lesson wasn't learned too well. But the test and trace was actually really interesting because we outsourced it to Deloitte. And yes, I do, and so does Rosie, have very strong opinions of what's happening around consulting, but at least if Deloitte had had that expertise, right? and test and trace, it would have kind of been forgivable, um, but they didn't. And in fact, that's, it wasn't such a surprise that they failed then to deliver uh, while also earning 1 million pounds a day is what the test and trace contract uh, amounted to in the UK. But anyway, all these examples of failing to deliver vaccines globally, to solve the digital divide, 
to, to foster a dynamic test and trace system. Again, globally, that was one of the biggest challenges um, and so on. Have we learned? Like, are we actually more prepared now? If there's another pandemic, and the scientists say there will be as the permafrost melts, right? There's a strong link between climate crises and health crises. Are we actually more prepared this time? Have we been investing in reducing the digital divide to zero? Because that's what it should be. Every kid in the world should have equal access to a digital technology uh, to access their education during a lockdown, but even not during lockdowns. We know that digital capabilities are so fundamental. And again, the answer is no. Um, so it was a wake up call. And in fact, what was interesting was that many governments actually then implemented much more dynamic types of policies than they normally do. So the Defense Production Procurement Act and outcomes oriented, are these the McKinsey folks leaving? No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, outcomes orientation to procurement, it was done even in Italy where things tend to be quite slow. I'm Italian, I'm allowed to criticize Italy, you are not. But in Italy, we went from being 100% dependent on uh, Chinese PPE, personal protection equipment. That was another failure, by the way. Many of the first deaths globally were healthcare workers that didn't have the PPE. Italy was 100% dependent on um, Chinese PPE. And within three months, because you remember that lots of the deaths actually initially were in the northern uh, part of Italy, and that was kind of highlighted. So they acted quickly. Within three months, they went to producing all their PPE through 137 companies. Uh, crowded in through actually a much more dynamic outcomes oriented procurement practice that we tend to just do kind of in war times globally. So it was sort of a wake up call. It also caused lots of collaboration. We did end up with eight vaccines, but again, we didn't actually learn how to achieve the mission accomplished bit. Um, so again, you know, this need to actually interact collectively, to innovate collectively, to share knowledge couldn't have been more important during COVID. And really a pity you're not seeing the titles, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we continue to have, of course, with climate, which has, you know, has been in the news much longer than COVID, lots of different scary statistics, including, by the way, that during COVID-19, lots of the COVID-19 recovery funds went to fossil fuel companies. So 56% of the COVID-19 recovery funding allocated to energy companies went to fossil fuel projects. I mean, that is pretty depressing given that there were real opportunities actually, just like anytime there's a bailout program to kind of embed a deal, some sort of conditionality. So you're dispersing the money that needs to be dispersed right away because many companies were hurting, but actually doing it with that kind of purpose orientation. On that, it's interesting always to remember that there's diversity, not, not every country is the same. It was quite interesting how uh, the UK ended up giving uh, 600 million to EasyJet, uh, no conditions attached during COVID-19 because obviously the airline wasn't flying and needed money. Whereas in France, not a perfect country, uh, but the uh, finance minister Bruno Le Maire actually put strong conditionality that both Air France and Renault, in order to um, access the French recovery had to commit to lowering their carbon emissions in the next five years. So, you know, all these things, state, uh, business and so on. There's different ways of doing state. There's different ways of doing a COVID-19 bailout. There's different ways of doing private sector uh, governance. With the vaccine, I should have mentioned that there too, it's very important to, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in looking at specifics. So like at projects, right? So you can just say vaccine, but actually there was eight different vaccines and how the public and private work together was very different across those vaccines. And that was actually one of the very interesting things in the UK, the AstraZeneca collaboration with Oxford was actually quite different from the other uh, collaborations. There was much more negotiation, uh, very much, what is that noise? <laughs> um, very much actually to, uh, to honor the, uh, the, the conditions in some ways that the publicly funded Oxford University researchers put on the deal with AstraZeneca. Um, committing to keeping costs low, prices low, joining different types of knowledge sharing platforms that the WHO was calling for, uh, and so on. Um, and not trying to make it into a, a gambling casino, uh, unlike uh, uh, Pfizer. I often tell my husband, if I don't come home at night, it was Pfizer, because it's about 20 years that I talk about Pfizer. Pfizer is one of the companies in the world alongside Exxon that actually engages in the most share buybacks 
So this, this problem that many people talk about in terms of shareholder value maximization and the effects that has, and many of us have looked at these numbers like the 6 trillion in the last 10 years that companies have spent just to buy back their shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. Pfizer is actually one of the uh, leading share buybackers. And, you know, again, not all companies do that, right? So governance, governance, governance. Um, so yes, with climate, we talk a lot about it, but there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. And the numbers up there, which you probably see, you might not see, are, are quite striking. And if, if you don't know enough about this, read the IPCC reports. They provide a lot of evidence that we are <laughs> in deep bleep bleep because we are not acting quick enough and we are soon making the problem irreversible. And we're also not learning from all sorts of other mistakes um, in terms of the so-called austerity. I don't like the word austerity because it's, it's a big word and actually we should actually be calling out exactly uh, what's happening, which is it's often not just the money that goes missing. So we end up spending less on really important areas, but the remit itself of the different public actors that are um, supposed to be dispersing the money uh, itself is actually one of the most important things to look at in terms of how that has been under attack. And I look at that in the entrepreneurial state, which is that when at best we think of the role of the public sector as fixing market failures, it's not surprising that its own remit starts to get reduced, even when budgets increase. The big myth about Ronald Reagan, by the way, was that he was a big budget cutter. He actually around a lot of different types of public investments, including the investments in the National Institutes of Health. So public money uh, around medicines increased the funds. Um, both he and Margaret Thatcher cut much more the welfare state, not the innovation state, um, definitely in the US. So we know that austerity didn't work. Even the IMF and the World Bank have written really good papers about this. Um, and when I say even is because they weren't, you know, in, in the past actually was often IMF loans, at least in the developing world that were conditional on austerity, reducing a, a public deficits. In Europe, we engage in massive austerity after the financial crisis. Um, so I always forget that we're no longer in Europe. So I always say in Europe, we, 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 but I'm, I'm still, Ital I mean, I'm Italian. So I don't know how many Europeans in the room, but the European Union's recovery program after the financial crisis was conditional, you'll recall, because of the fights between Greece and Germany, on member states reducing their public deficits. Um, and there was this kind of number, 3%. Slowly, it actually became 0%. Many of those countries ran surpluses for a while, proud to be running surpluses. Spain cut its publicly funded R&D by 40, uh, research and development by 40% in order to reduce its deficit to access at the time, after the financial crisis, the bailout uh, scheme. And what then happened was that many countries, including Italy, but also in Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, what you actually saw was that while deficits were falling, debt to GDP ratios were actually rising. And it's not rocket science. Why, right? If the denominator GDP, if a long run driver of it is not just private investment, but also public investment in all those areas that increase productivity, for example, long run productivity, you can think why it is that if you're just cutting your spending, the, denom the numerator, the deficit is falling, and yet debt to GDP can be rising because you're actually not growing or your productivity is not growing. But it also killed our social fabric, something that that's why I actually don't like the word austerity. We should, we should be talking about actually what's happening in communities when mental health programs are cut, when after school clubs are, uh, pro programs are cut, when youth centers are cut. If you look at what's happened around knife crime in London, on the back of that austerity, the kind of social and economic determinants of crime, something my son is looking at, Leon, who did his... Uh, thesis actually on this at York, the social and economic determinants of knife crime. Many different people are interested in these things. Michael Marmot at UCL, uh, where, where I uh, teach, he's looking at the social and economic determinants of health, all those different types of investments that we should be thinking about that can actually reduce um, the symptoms of inequality. Um, and there is a strong correlation between those cuts that we made and then the kind of symptoms uh, that happened. Did we learn from that? No. And in fact, now, because after all these furlough schemes and different types of uh, uh, generous public uh, in investments also, uh, we now say, oh, but we have to start 
tightening our belt again, right? We need to get those deficits down. We need to reduce debt to GDP, not learning that lesson that the real question, the granular question is not more state, less state, but what kind of investment in terms of our social infrastructure, our physical infrastructure, and not just R&D you know, ratios, but really fostering a dynamic innovation system um, and including as many people as possible. So of course, public education, there's no investment that's more important than public education in terms of the real uh, leveling up uh, across society. Um, and what's interesting is I started looking back um, at some of the, or not critiques, I'd say constructive critiques I've been making uh, to the Labour Party is that there's strong, um, how, how can I say this without it sounding like too much of a critique? Because I really hope here wins the election uh, when it happens. But you know that one of the most important things is really to go beyond that idea that it's either austerity or investment. It's about the how. And one of the most important things about the how is how do you actually work with business in a functional way and not a dysfunctional way, which of course this country experienced with the PFI schemes in the health sector, the private financing initiatives, which I don't have to go into. There's many different studies that have looked at that. But that idea that, so this was an article I wrote just last week uh, on, on that, that, you know, that we really need a narrative and a new story within the Labour Party of how to work together between the public and the private sector so we don't get what I was quite frustrated with in 2015, which is that after labor lost the election, this idea that, oh, we lost because we looked like we weren't serious, not only about the economy, but that we weren't business friendly, right? Why should you be business friendly? What you want to do is collaborate with business. You want to share investments, share risks, have some sort of purpose and work together towards those. But even just this idea that it's about being friendly opens you up to lots of, again, very dysfunctional uh, policies, which I've been looking at over the years. But it was, it was quite interesting that I think at the time was Tony Blair, Chuka Muna, who then went off in the uh, somewhere um, in the scandal, literally the day after the loss of the election, the narrative was we have lost because we didn't know how to talk about business. And if we don't know how to talk about business, we're not serious about the economy. And if we're not serious about the economy, we're going to lose. Right, so hopefully this is a moment where we can truly tell different stories and we don't go back to those dichotomous kind of ways of thinking and the problematic theory that has actually fostered that kind of problematic thinking. There's a link between theory and practice, right? What uh, sociologists call performativity, how you actually measure something and, and measure the performance kind of feeds back into what we see on the ground. And that then affects again, the stories and the theories and the framings that we have about that thing. Um, and lots of what I've tried to do is also kind of go after this idea that, you know, that at best the public sector can fix. <laughs> uh, so at worst, get out of the way, you're rubbish. At best, you're there to fix different types of market failures to the point that even the public good, which is supposed to be good because there's two words and one of them is good, is still framed in terms of uh, correcting for a gap that is, is is filled is that sorry is not filled because of the lack of private sector investment. So you know basic research and development, um, there's not enough uh, private sector investment in it because it's very hard to appropriate the returns to that, and that's why no one really uh, how do you say um, debates whether you should have public investment in basic R and D. Um, but this idea that you're either fixing for a positive externality of that sort or fixing for a negative externality through something like a carbon tax, or fixing for the fact that we have asymmetric information. So information failures, all these different types of failures literally puts you in constant bandaging up mode, in constant reactive mode, in constant filling the gap mode. There's not an objective, but a correction. And so that to me is, is, is one of the biggest problems of the story we tell. Um, and again, even just the notion that there's a market out there that sometimes it screws up and needs to be fixed. That's a story, a very different story from the one I talked about before, which Carl Polanyi talked about as markets as outcomes, outcomes of all those difficult governance decisions and interactions. Um, and of course, there's a very uh, strong story out there about shareholder value. Um, I hope the Zoomers are actually online because it's because of you guys that the people in the audience cannot see the titles, but we are very happy to have as many Zoomers as possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just to know, you guys can see the titles, people in the room can't. Uh, so the story about uh, shareholder value, but also stakeholder value. 
is a very specific story. And it's all actually about risk, this idea that there's residual claimants, shareholders are the residual claimants, are the only ones who don't have a guaranteed rate of return as though anyone else does. Again, the investments made in the internet, for every internet, there's many different failures. For every Tesla investment that the government made, there is many, many failures, including Solyndra. It was Solyndra and Tesla, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, were actually part of the same portfolio. Um, so there's lots of risk taking in government. There's risk taking, of course, within uh, workers when they take on a job. They might, you know, they don't have a lifelong career. You might accept a lower wage in the beginning, thinking that you actually have a career in a company. There's no guarantee. So if you actually look at the story, it's a story about shareholder value. Um, it, it has to be unpicked based on its premise. You can't just say, "Oh, that's no good." Let's have stakeholder value. You really need to unpick the underlying theory of where value comes from according to those who believe that at best we can maximize shareholder value in order to actually start saying we need something better. Instead, what I believe has gone wrong in terms of the business roundtable or Larry Fink, who's part of the business roundtable and all these great CEOs who talk about the need to give back, give back to workers, give back to communities and talking about stakeholder value in that way is that it's quite a comfortable way to talk about value. You still produce all the value. You're still the wealth creator, the value creator. Oh, and to be good, we need to kind of spread that wealth. Um, and that's why you also get foundations and philanthropies. I always say that Bezos should just do good at the company and don't worry about the philanthropy. We don't need bad business models and then getting those profits to be put into uh, philanthropic income. How do you do good through your business model? How you create value differently? Um, that actually requires a different theory of value itself. Something I looked at uh, in my book, Value of Everything. And the reason I invited, sorry, this is where I'm gonna embarrass you guys. <laughs> I don't know if George the Poet is here as well, but Francis and Brian, is George here? It's coming later. Um, is that I really think that the storytellers of our time are not necessarily with an economic <gasps> surprise. <laughs> you all thought that the economists are the best storytellers. So the fact that we actually need to work together to solve problems together and the problems we have are getting worse and worse and that I believe we are in real difficulty in how we're working together and don't actually differentiate, as I mentioned, what biologists would differentiate a mutualistic ecosystem, a collaborative symbiotic ecosystem versus a parasitic predator prey one, which I, I would argue we have very good examples of, of parasitic ecosystems in the health sector. How do we actually do that? And I think Brian, the reason I have, it, that, that it's just been wonderful being your Friend, and the reason I invited you here is that you've always put this idea of collective intelligence, the seniors as creative intelligence of the community at the center of how you work, how you think, how you talk about also politics and policy. Um, and in fact, this is one of the reasons I, I had you and George the Poet, who's doing a PhD with us on those issues in terms of looking at the history of black music and the huge amounts of collective intelligence that that required and then where did that wealth go? It didn't go back into those same communities to foster more creativity and collaboration. There's lots of extraction uh, in those sectors, but really without even talking about extraction, the idea that actually it's not about the lone entrepreneur, the garage tinker, the Silicon Valley genius um, and the entrepreneurial state. The whole point was looking at all those different collective investments in the private sector, large, medium, small companies, the public sector, lots of different types of organizations who actually collaborated and learned from each other across the entire innovation chain. Lots of collaboration, even though ultimately we kind of socialized a lot of that risk-taking, but also then privatized a lot of the rewards, which is a separate point. But you talk about how when we confuse geniuses with, with the seniors, the creative intelligence of the community, we end up actually wasting. We're not only wasting time, we're wasting resources, we're wasting our intelligence because we actually can learn from each other. And that level of experimentation, which uh, Stefano Mancuso, an Italian biologist who I just came to know his work, he says, this is how plants learn. Plants actually have a decentralized brain. Um, and and, and you know, we should be learning much more from biology than in economics. We've been wed to Newtonian physics, <laughs> right? So center of gravity, unique equilibria, average agents, we don't really understand or we haven't really put it at the center of our focus, that kind of diverse and heterogeneous uh, ways of thinking. We are different, but learning from those differences and really putting that uh, at the center.
And, and Francis, I had two slides for you, but I put them only for one here. Um, you've talked a lot about how for the work that you do in a museum, the Tate Modern, Francis Morris is the head of the uh, Tate Modern, the amazing stuff that you've done, like getting people to walk into a museum for the first time who never have been in a museum and showcasing artists that are often left out of what can be called just a very elite uh, way that uh, museums are often stru structured and showcase art. You've done that notwithstanding that the ways that public museums, free museums are valued is basically based on blockbuster models. So the incentive is actually in theaters, it's bums on seats, in museums like the Tate, it's selling ticket sales. So the Cezanne kind of exhibits, this is on right now at the Tate? Yes, yes, this finished. Um, that it's not that we shouldn't have those blockbuster shows, they're great and there's huge value in them. But if we don't actually think, what is the value of art? What is the value of having a museum that actually achieves just even those two objectives of getting people to walk into a museum that has never walked into a museum, then we have that performativity problem that I talked about um, in but the sociology is that it's not neutral. These mechanisms that we actually value are not neutral and they actually create uh, uh, problems for those people who are actually interested in that much wider uh, sharing of, of value, but also valuation. The green book that the treasury uses to value its investments in the arts is not neutral. Uh, if you think of everything in terms of cost benefit analysis and net present value, you end up getting a particular type of organization. And I always say that if someone had done a cost benefit analysis of the Apollo program, they would have never ever bothered. And the actual uh, results of that program were all these spillovers across the economy, all the solutions to the many different problems that had to be solved along the way to the moon, got us things like camera phones, foil blankets, baby formula software. So how do we measure those dynamic spillovers across the economy? Do we have strong metrics for that in our green book? Not really, and my institute's actually helping to make that happen. So this is Georgia Poet, who, uh, if you haven't heard his podcast, you must. He won the Peabody Award uh, for it, and, and he's doing a PhD with us uh, around at UCL at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose precisely on these things. How do we actually value that collective intelligence, which historically, in terms of Black music, has been distributed across the world? Um, how do we actually uh, learn how to value it, how to also uh, allow those that are creating it to see themselves as value creators. You know, the kind of lottery model that one in a whatever thousand make a lot of money and the rest don't and actually end up not with uh, jobs, sometimes in the criminal justice system and so on. How do we actually change that from the beginning in terms of the self-worth and the value that we place on that art? How do we invest in it? How do we share it and reinvest in that sharing in terms of the communities where this art happens? And how do we also tell it? So the, he, he talks about hip hop as social broadcasting, in terms of broadcasting the reality uh, in, that's happening in many different types of communities. So all these different issues of you know, who are we valuing it? Who are we valuing? How do we value it? How do we reinvest in it? That requires much bigger thinking than just thinking about uh, art as a um, investment that needs some sort of cost benefit uh, uh, calculation. So what I've tried to do, and I'm not going to go into this, this was just to say what actually got me and Rosie actually into the big con question. But what I've tried to do, at least through my different books, is to, just to tell that very different story of where value comes from. Um, and perhaps most, most uh, uh, urgently, what we need to do to reorient our economies to actually be able to find those kind of solutions that we, again, talk a lot about, blah, 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 but then don't end up valuing the kinds of uh, resources, structures, collaborations, learnings um, along the way. So in the entrepreneurial state, just quickly, it was kind of debunking the whole theory of innovation that somehow risk-taking is all in one part of the economy, the other at best needs to de-risk it, and the kind of dysfunctional dynamic that that then brings in, which is that the government ends up even investing in areas which we don't know how to value, but even when it does, we end up not sharing that value, we end up with the dysfunctional dynamic in the health sector, where in the US, 42 billion a year is spent by the government in drugs that then the prices of those drugs don't uh, uh, embed any value that was produced by the taxpayer. We have value-based pricing, which basically allows prices to go to infinity to what the market will bear. Then it gets subsidized by different uh, welfare states. 
the intellectual property rights that I talked about before aren't structured in such a way that really um, uh, represent how that value was actually created. So we've allowed intellectual property rights to be too strong, too upstream, too wide, and so on. Um, and in value of everything, it kind of broke down the problem in terms of, well, then if it is, if value is created collectively by lots of different actors, what's the kind of new type of economic theory we need that goes beyond the production function of just inputs and outputs and where the state itself is framed in this very problematic and narrow way. Um, and also this, this, this idea that if we don't know how to talk about value creation in a, a more interesting way than we currently talk about it, it's not surprising then that we don't even know how to differentiate value creation from value extraction, which the classical political economists talked about in terms of profits versus rents. What is our theory of rent today when we talk about excess profits in the energy sector? In excess of what, <laughs> right? So this used to be one of the biggest questions um, that economists pose themselves in the time of Adam Smith, where he called rent robbery. Adam Smith, by the way, his idea of the free market was actually free from rent, not free from the state. And one of the points that I argue in this book is that we've actually kind of decimated our understanding of rent. So it's not surprising that many of the things we include in GDP, where we include anything with a price, if we don't know how to distinguish value extraction from value creation, we've ended up including many services in GDP just because they have a price without that kind of analysis of, is it actually creating value or not? Something that the physiocrats in the 1700s cared about when they made the tableau économique and actually looked at the sterile class that they were very worried about because they worried about the, the value that was being created by the farmers. If it's not reinvested back in, but extracted out by the merchants and the landlords, it's actually gonna render the system unreproducible, unsustainable, sterile, you, you know, using a very strong word. Um, so if we actually open up our understanding of value, then that's actually gonna help us not only point to and nurture and resource that collective value creation, but also share that value uh, in more equitable ways. And that's why the notion of stakeholder value today, as it's being talked about out there, I think remains weak because it's not actually built on an alternative idea. In mission economy, I kind of turn this into a recipe book, which is, okay, so how do we then actually work together with kind of mission-oriented, outcomes-oriented uh, 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 goals, which the SDGs are out there, they're ready to be tackled, they are challenges, but how do we transform those challenges into what I call missions that can really bring lots of different sectors together and actors together in the economy. The moon landing was not just aerospace, it was, it required investment in nutrition, materials, electronics, software, um, and they were very careful to design the contracts as such. And the first thing NASA did which was really interesting, they changed how they did procurement to be outcomes oriented, because at the time it was cost plus, they were just getting charged quite a bit of money from the businesses they were working with. And they said, we're not gonna get to the moon with this design of a policy instrument. And that's why they brought in this fixed price kind of challenge oriented uh, procurement model with incentives for quality improvement and innovation. And they also, this was super interesting given the energy crisis today, put in every contract, no excess profits. So in excess of what? Coming back to today's uh, discussions about energy companies earning record level profits. And by the way, often spending almost half of what they're earning. Uh, 32.5 billion is what a uh, combination of Shell and two other energy companies earned this year and they spent half of it on share buybacks. Um, so there's lots of critiques of that, right? They're earning excess profits without much discussion of what that means. For NASA, what that meant when they put it into the contract, it was in excess of what you're doing, right? You need lots of different actors to get to the moon. 400,000 people got us there. Let's not turn this into a gambling casino, right? Let's not do what we've ended up doing in health and some other uh, sectors. So this to me was fascinating that it's, it wasn't just a technological aerospace project. It was a political economic project, right? Just the fact that they had to change those tools like procurement change the contracts. Um, and one of the things that Rosie and I, um, well, actually in this book I talk about, and then with the book in the big con we look into is how they were super aware in NASA that if they were would constantly outsource their own capacity, which they were already doing, 
McKinsey, oh, I keep talking about McKinsey. McKinsey um, was set up in the 1920s, but McKinsey already in the 60s was actually working very closely with NASA. And the guy who set up this new procurement uh, method, the, the um, fixed price with incentives for innovation, his name was Ernest Brackett. He said, we've got to watch out because we got to work with a lot of actors in the economy. We need that seniors. We won't even know who to work with. We won't know how to write the terms of reference. We won't know how to write the contracts if we continue to outsource our capacity. Um, and he said, because they didn't have PowerPoints at the time, he said, we will get captured by Roche Shermanship. So in other words, cute brochures, right? Sexy brochures that would convince NASA to work with a particular uh, company. And, and I think that's actually what we've ended up with in, in many um, uh, governments. And this again is what uh, Rosie and I um, look at. I think my second lecture will just be on the book. Um, <clears throat> And, and so what we really look at is that we don't even blame the consultants. We actually blame the governments that have stopped investing within their own brains. They've been captured by brochuremanship, exactly what Ernest Brackett predicted in the 1960s. And if you stop investing within your brain, what my colleague uh, uh, Reiner just wrote a, a great book called Creative Bureaucracies, right? We need creative bureaucracies for that. We need creative dynamic capabilities within the public sector. If you stop doing that, you will need increasingly others to help you do stuff, right? And even when you are doing it and have good people, you will be scared to make mistakes because of this problematic way that we talk about the role of government, where when a venture capitalist prides himself or herself at taking risks and for every Genentech investment by Kleiner Perkins, we had to you know, go through many different types of failures when a civil servant makes a mistake front page of the Daily Mail. So also that narrative and ideology that at best we're fixing markets or be careful, you know, don't crowd out the business sector, know your place, uh, which is again, the market failure theory, don't shape and create markets like by the way, the BBC has always done. The BBC within public broadcasting is a rare entity globally. Most public broadcasters think that their role because they're public and not private is to do what the private sector is not doing, right? So high quality documentaries, high quality news. The BBC was like, yeah, we'll do that. We're also gonna do soap operas and talk shows, but we're gonna have a measure within of public value that's gonna hold us accountable. So we'll change how soap operas are done. EastEnders, right? Do uh, soap operas with the working class and not just the rich and famous like Dallas and Dynasty. You're way too young, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but also talk shows that were bringing different types of people to the screen, both those things, by the way, then ended up being kind of mainstream and then the private sector came in. So truly crowded in, but the way you crowd in is actually being ambitious. So that market shaping idea, they're actually transforming the landscape, not just fixing holes and plugging holes here and there, requires huge dynamic capabilities. And that's actually what also attracts talent. The BBC until now um, has, and by the way, until now, I'm not talking about the recent debate this week, but because it's actually under attack in many ways, like the NHS is under attack and so on, when the BBC has been able to explicitly be actively shaping markets and not worried about the narrative that actually Netflix is more uh, you know, uh, innovative than you in the same way that NASA's told Elon Musk is more innovative than you, so on and so forth, has actually been able to attract real talent, a lot of talent into the BBC. It's an honor to work in the BBC you're a top journalist or even an R&D person, they actually have an R&D department. So the more we dismiss government, the harder it is to bring in top talent. The reason that Obama, while Europe was undergoing all that austerity after the financial crisis, the US did an 800 billion stimulus program. Um, and one of the things they did was to say, we're gonna direct this towards the green economy. We're gonna set up an ARPA-E, like DARPA, but in energy. And in thinking that ambitiously, they were able to attract a top Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, to, the direct, to direct the DOE. So a Nobel Prize winning physicist agrees to be a civil servant, not because of the Singaporean uh, uh, salaries that they offer to their civil servants, but because there was a real mission, a, a, a remit to help redirect an economy. So what we do in the book is we make this relationship between the slow dismissal of what government is for, uh, including the budgets themselves in terms of the ways of austerity, uh, we look at the neoliberal side of that in terms of ideology, but we also look at how it was then also in some ways propagated by um, new labor. When new labor came in, the third way, 
uh, this idea that, no, we're not against government. That's Thatcher and Reagan. We're for government, but we're going to make government really efficient. <laughs> we're going to make government almost look like the private sector. Uh, so the delivery units, the cost benefit analysis, the net present value calculations that I alluded to before also start to get introduced through new public management, public choice theory, um, which wasn't just the third way in new labor, but it was actually one of their kind of key anchors, which is to say, of course, government is required, but without then actually having a strong theory of public value and public purpose, the problem is that then you end up almost emulating what you think is really dynamic and risk-taking and creating value in the private sector, or I should say, uh, um, not debunking that idea that value creation is there and saying that government, however, in order to be efficient, needs to bring in some of these um, metrics that the private sector uses. Um, and that kind of opened the door for consultants. And then what we look at is how the, there's a conflict of interest, right? That if actually able government is less needing of consultants to do the center of government, maybe they just need to do the side of government, then what incentive is there from the consulting industry, which today is close to a trillion dollar industry to actually make those governments more capable? So it's almost like an, incent an incentive problem, like you know, a therapist who would have no incentive for their client to ever get out of therapy, you'd think that wasn't a very good therapist. We also look at conflicts of interest in terms of the same consultancy companies working on both sides of the street without that being transparent. So in South Africa, working both for a state-owned enterprise like ESCOM, while you're also working and consulting for the treasury, which is supposed to be regulating that entity. So lack of kind of a clarity and transparency. Um, and so, you know, really what we do then in the end is to call for a change in that, both in terms of transparent contracts, but also really calling for governments to stop, <laughs> to stop being so wed did to uh, this form of governance, which is also, as I mentioned, on the back of governments having to fear so much of making mistakes. So happy to have someone else come in and take that risk, even though when they fail, like Deloitte failed with Test and Trace, like McKinsey failed with Australia's climate program, there's very little accountability. So there's that irony that you're actually saying, we don't want to fail because we're not allowed to fail. Let's let someone else take the risk. But when those others actually take the risk and mess up. There's very little accountability because of how those business models are actually set up. Um, and, and, and this is the, the, the Lord who, uh, Agnew, who said, if this goes on, we're gonna have a completely infantilized Whitehall. So we, we put that in the title. We also put in the title that it weakens businesses. We call out businesses who actually like to have their own policies rubber stamped by the Deloitte's and the McKinsey's not owning their own sometimes controversial uh, decisions. We look at the history of capitalism is the history of consulting in terms of how many trends like downsizing, like um, privatization, like share buybacks, or today ESG metrics and climate policies have offered these opportunities for the consultants to surf those waves, often without much expertise of those particular matters, but great ways to uh, enter the, um, the boardroom. Um, why? Because often the boardroom itself will find it more um, uh, sorry, um, easier to, to, to put some decisions down their throats in terms of the, what's that? Is it Mary Poppins or Sound of Music? The, the syrup. Yeah, spoonful of sugar. Uh, so having some policies within even the business sector rubber stamped by uh, the consulting companies has been a way to kind of say, okay, well, this wasn't us that made the decision to, 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 to you know, un undergo massive uh, layoff scheme. But especially we look at how the, you know, even the more kind of trendy things around ESG, environmental, social governance metrics and, and climate have been opportunities, not for that real collaboration and the seniors that Brian talks about, collective learning means expertise, sharing of knowledge, but actually, unfortunately, this kind of parasitic type of, type of ecosystem where gaps big gaps in one area are filled by another, in this case, the consultants, uh, without actually leading to a better system, a system that actually knows how to deal with that problem better. <laughs> and those examples I gave in the beginning, um, like the test and trace system is just kind of a, a, an obvious one. Um, so look, I've actually gone over time. Um, what I will say is I'm not very religious, but the Pope actually talks about the common good all the time. And he's reading my book. How cool is that? <laughs> Uh, I just have to put there because how many times do you get a picture of the Pope reading your book? I'm sorry.
But what I just find very interesting, and maybe we'll just skip ahead because I should probably finish in, in two minutes, is that that idea of the common good by a religious figure, we know the church is very conservative. It is also very, you know, there, there, there's all sorts of prob <laughs> problems within uh, religions globally. So this isn't a defense of the Pope in any way. But what's interesting is that when he talks about the common good, he gives examples, examples from framing. He talks about the preferential option of the poor, principles of subsidiarity. Um, what I think we're actually lacking, and forget whether those are right or wrong and what they mean for now, because I don't have time. We don't actually have principles within economics of the common good. We have the public good, which again, sounds good because there's two words and one is good. And that's the correction for a market failure. We have theories about common pool resources in the work of Eleanor Armstrong, which is incredibly important. But if you look actually at all the, these different four ways that we took, you know, private good clothes, club goods, cable TV, public goods, clean water, common pool resources, fisheries and forests, none of them actually embody these ideas that I'm talking about, which is what are we actually trying to do? How are we actually gonna get there through intense, intense collaboration, learning, experimentation? Uh, Reiner uh, was just reminding me that the Greeks uh, talked about experimentation to the point that they actually had a lottery system who actually enters government because they thought it was very important to renew. But they also talked about those that didn't have a sense of the common good as idiots. <laughs> very clear uh, what their theory was. Um, but so what's interesting is that we actually need, I believe, in order to take seriously these goals that we have, and I always go back to the SDGs because we agreed to them. Forget whether they're right or wrong. Every country agreed to the sustainable development goals. They can be turned into missions, which are concrete. We can answer yes or no, but they require huge amounts of collective investment, not just public and private. Remember, citizen societies or uh, civic societies are also, for example, very important um, in, in community-based um, uh, goals. But so the idea that we have to move from a correction to an objective, from market failure thinking to market shaping, to outcome and process-oriented uh, thinking, collective interaction, yes, bottom-up, but of course those goals themselves are very crucial to also be clear uh, top-down. This does require also thinking of what do we actually even mean by public value in ways that is much more ambitious, I think, than we have so far. The reason I do like the BBC, you can just read our report here. The orange one is called Creating and Measuring Dynamic Public Value at the BBC. They actually have tried to think about this. You know, what is public value? It's lots of things. It's how do we actually, you know, their, their, their idea of, um, what is it? Uh, educate, inform, what's the third one? Entertain, yeah, actually they've used to, to develop a theory of value in terms of individual value, social value, fighting against fake news, uh, uh, industry value, really pushing the frontiers, which of course they've done with uh, iPlayer, but also uh, investing in all sorts of R&D around documentaries, which has then crowded in other forms of investment. Just to say that if, if, if we actually care about these goals and rethinking also then the governance structures, that also means having a different theory, not only of value creation, but also how do you hold those same entities accountable? It's not just about public investment. This is the reason I like the BBC example, because they use public value to hold themselves accountable. It's not just money trees and throwing money at public problems. But that idea that you really need that, and I have to stop, otherwise I have a thousand other slides, so I will stop. And plus I have these other one or two lectures, we don't know still, um, that will come about. Like, what do we actually mean about putting the common good so purpose orientation at the center of policy design. What's a purpose oriented industrial strategy versus one that's just giving out money to sectors? What's a purpose orientation to a procurement strategy? What does it mean to bring in true co-creation? Another word that's also often thrown out there, but it's a bit fluffy. Um, we looked, for example, in Sweden where they have this really interesting mission, which is a fossil free welfare state. And then they, bring it down to the very particular like school meals. So school meals in Sweden have to be healthy, tasty, and sustainable. So not just Ikea meatballs. And what's interesting is not only does that transform the whole supply chain of food into the world's biggest restaurant chain, school meals, but also it, there is an opportunity then for that to be co-created with the students. So co-creation, which is something I haven't talked about yet, I think is, is central. I have talked about the vaccine. I'll just put one last slide. Sorry, this is a lot of stuff. This is my last slide because 
We're not in Camden. No, not so. We're at UCL. We still, are we in Camden? No, what's LSC? Huh? Yes, we we're still in Camden. Down the street. In. We are in Camden. What, just in this? What do I mean? We in, in the building? No. <laughs> oh, I see. Don't go across the road. We're still in Camden. So Camden has a, a renewal commission, which I co-chair with um, Georgia Gould. And one of the really interesting things here is where we really focused on that idea, not only of purpose, um, purpose oriented policies, but co-creation. So for example, the, the clean growth mission, which we house in the housing estates in Camden, the first thing was to get the people living in the housing estates at the table to actually talk about sustainability, green growth, what does it mean for communities, but also changing the setup. So food banks, which have grown uh, 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 in our economy as we become more and more unequal and with COVID, grew a lot and now with the cost of living crisis growing even more, how do you transform it into a food cooperative, right? And why is that so transformational? So that the people benefiting from a food bank are in charge of the sourcing of the food, of thinking about the green sourcing of the food. So that kind of transformation of the institutions, the policy design, so you know, whether it's industrial strategy, procurement or food bank or clean growth mission in a housing estate, these ideas currently, these are just stories I'm telling, especially because I'm supposed to be finishing and I'm not, they require principles. We require a theory of the common good. We require a, an economic theory of the seniors to properly uh, have that communal intelligence, which we don't have. And I guess this is just a call to action for all the great economists in the room, um, not only to read my books, no, but to actually work together with us because I don't have the answer. I mean, we've had 100 years of economic theory, which has convinced us that public goods are this very narrow way to think about the good. And I do believe that there's a real space out there, not only for the economics of human rights, which I alluded to, which is again, big open space, but definitely the economics of the common good. And how can we really then also have a theory of collective intelligence that is transformed into a theory of growth, but directed growth and not just leveling the playing field. So thank you so much. I've gone over. <laughs> well, what a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Now, um, I know people are dying to ask, ask questions. Do you want to take them in sort of threes or ones or how? Um, threes? Threes. We'll take them in threes. Who wants to go first? Please, when you make your question, uh, put up your hand, obviously. And then uh, when I ask you, state your name and affiliation. And then a short question, because we haven't got that long. Who wants to go first? Yes, my name is Stefano Bonfo. I'm from Oxford Sustainable Development Enterprise, and I'm dealing with data. So, uh, data. Data. Yes. So, how you can have innovation if you don't have data at the beginning? You're talking, data is not artificial intelligence. Data is not advanced technology. Data is something that brings value, and therefore, Having the data, it means you can live with the value, with each other, with innovation, with value, with, let's say, all this type of common goal yeah. that you are mentioning just in the conversation. The question is, where are the data? Thanks. Data for what, though? Like, your question Over is, there. where is the data? I mean, in all this process of yeah. creating value, yeah of uh, let's say cooperation yeah. of partnership mm -hmm. the data are the center because you cannot okay, have a partnership if you don't have a key idea how you call it data yeah. how you come with innovative idea yeah. thank you mm -hmm. yeah so um Thanks, that was really interesting. Uh, my name is Dan Pine. I'm a, I work for a private architecture company. Um, I was interested that you uh, spoke about the space race because the um, part of the cause of the, or the, the purpose of the space race was to for the American way of doing things to beat Russia or 
communism uh, and if you're going to talk about sort of um uh, economics as a as a serve sort of the economy to serve something what, what do you have to say in terms of uh what we should be doing for to, for for economies now so or democracy to sort of be able to yeah. do what they wanted to do in in the 60s which was to beat communism essentially so yeah. and now with the rise of um um with china um and sort of the idea that now because we had the idea that, that democracies would always be more successful than authoritarian regimes but how, how do you sort of square that mm -hmm. so that that really the primary goal is to spread democracy through successful economy thank you hi thanks vicky johnson uh, university of the highlands and islands um i just wondered you talk about the digital divide mm -hmm. and the effect on education of covid i wondered how you incorporated the voices and perspectives of young people <clears throat> and understanding their different perspectives within communities and mm -hmm. how we can listen to them? Thanks. Great question. Is this me? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and I might actually ask Reiner to come in on the data one. I'm, I'm going to take them um, in reverse. Actually, I'm going to take the middle one first, then come to you, and then take the data one, which is a central question. And we're working with Barcelona, by the way, which actually... Ah, fantastic. Are, what's your name? Are you Italian or Spanish? Italian. Okay. Benissima. Almeno in Italiano. <laughs> um, actually, why don't we start with the with with that? Because he's Italian. Not. I always say in Italy, no matter what you say, it sounds good. Like the word for you know the reform of public administration, which ended up with all these cuts in Italy, is called la riforma della pubblica amministrazione. So yeah, it's all about dynamic capabilities. No, it was cuts. Um, and actually in Italy, what's interesting, sorry if I'm just going off on a tangent, but it's actually related to that question, because there's corruption, um, and there's corruption everywhere, we just make a theater of it, I mean, there's lots of corruption here, but just whatever, um, they do their economic policy, some of the most ambitious ones, in an agency called l'Agenzia Nazionale dell'Anticorruzione, ANAC, is where public sector procurement is designed in Italy. Imagine that. So it's not only market failure theory where you're, you have to almost fear that there's going to be a failure to design a policy, but you're also going to be accused of corruption, which, of course, needs to be tackled by proper metrics. But how will we ever have you know, an interesting outcomes oriented procurement or any policy done in an agency that is about anti-corruption? Right. That's interesting. Data. I mean, first of all, you, you know more than I do. Data is constantly being created. So one of the interesting things that, for example, they did in, in Barcelona was to say, every time you click on Uber or City Mapper, you are creating data. Where does that data go? And so they set up under Ada Colau, the mayor, and I increasingly think, by the way, in lots of things I'm talking about, mayors and cities and local entities have done the most interesting experimentation. We should be funneling the learning to the federal and the national, but the resources from the national to the local. But that learning they have, and actually also we have uh, Fernando, there you are, um, who maybe you want to say something about this, but they've thought about in terms of the data commons, how do you actually build in terms of public sector capabilities inside the civil service so that we're sure that when that data is created, it's not just going to intermediary organizations that then sell it to you, but the city itself is able to use the knowledge about that data to improve decisions being made on social housing, on public transport, and so on. But that's a huge, not only investment, but change in thinking of what you need. You, you need hackers, you need computer hackers inside the civil service. Um, and, if, and one of our professors, Francesca Bria, who maybe you know, you know her very good, we have so much in common, <laughs> um, is actually teaching within our program, our master's in public administration, which is all about these ideas, how do you actually get so if there's any undergrads, come to us, don't go to LSE. You have a great MPA. The LSE MPA is still about public choice here, new public management. We have a whole other curriculum. Now they're going to get me off the stage. They'll turn this off. Um, and, and she's teaching precisely these questions. How do you, first of all, understand data that's constantly being created? Every time you do something, you're creating data, but who owns it? And But also, how do we govern it? How do we govern it in terms of, it's interesting, in terms of the common good, a data commons 
where are you know, interesting experiments that have done that and not. The space race question, yeah, sorry, because the problem is when you talk about everything, you, forgot, you forget to actually say all the stuff that makes it a bit more clear, which is that's exactly the point, right? We know like when things are done for the military industrial complex, including now with Ukraine, money comes out of thin air, right? Germany, just some months ago before the, or not a month ago now, a year ago, uh, was saying there was no money. They had to worry about their debt and, you know, and so on with the new government that came in. The war comes and rightly so, we need to, you know, act and 190 billion out of thin air, right? So the space race or military industrial complex problems have never created the kind of discourse we have, oh, there's no money. Or if we spend you know, more in health, we need to spend less in education. We have always, especially in countries with sovereign currencies, it's we don't have to go into the whole MMT thing because that's not the point here. But the point is that when we treat something as urgent, right? And the space race was seen as urgent because we have to beat the Russians. And it was again, tied to the defense system. Not only is money created, um, but the, the tools are done in an outcomes oriented way. Even by the way, health, it's so interesting to me because I've been, as I said, denouncing what's happening in health for 20 years now. When the US military funds health because soldiers get sick on the battlefield, they don't get screwed by the Pfizer's. They negotiate properly. They do patents completely different. They, they do pricing completely different. They don't do value-based pricing, which is a scam, right? They make sure that the prices that are coming back to them embed <laughs> the fact that they also invested, right? That they, you know, that public contribution is nested within the pricing model. Um, and they also make sure they share the knowledge. I mean, all this stuff today about the patent pool with the World Health Organization, that kind of negotiation about sharing knowledge. It's so interesting to unpick the contracts. Mm -hmm. I'm increasingly interested just in contracts, looking at contracts when they're done seriously and when they're done in, in very problematic ways where one side obviously has much more legal expertise. It's not just the the you know the the public sector expertise that we've been looking at that's been dismantled, but literally like the legal expertise who's got access to that. Um, and so the point then is if the sustainable development goals were treated with the same level of urgency, why? Because we signed up to them, right? As our military industrial complex problems that we treat as urgent, what would it look like then to create that investment pathway, but also those kinds of contracts along the way? Now, the SDGs, of course, are challenges. Like the space race was the challenge. They had to turn it into a mission, getting to the moon and back in a short amount of time. We haven't really done that with the SDGs. They've remained at that space race, beat the Russians level. We haven't treated them with the seriousness of that, but we haven't also transformed them into concrete missions that bring together many different parts of society and that are done in such a way that, that the, the design of the contracts crowd in experimentation, but also share in the benefits, right? So, so those are the, that's what I argue in the mission economy book. I kind of unpack what that would look like if we actually treated them seriously, um, both in terms of experimentation, the learning that Brian talks about, but also literally at the level of the contracts, that kind of AstraZeneca Oxford model of the vaccine, which was very different. Just look at it, the, the details of it, how different it was from the other vaccines. And the, um, the digital divide question. I mean, first of all, I don't work on the digital divide. I'm an economist who tries to help you know, policymakers not just give out money here and there, SMEs or some sectors, I say, what are the problems, <laughs> right? Focus on the problem. And if digital divide is one of the problems that you're going to go after, and it should be, because again, it means that people don't have access to their human right to education. Uh, what does that change in terms of how you do your all of government approach in the same way that climate policy cannot just be done by the Department of Energy, uh, well-being policies, not just for the Department of Health, a digital divide making it zero so everyone has equal access is going to require an all of government approach, but also many different sectors in the economy. The kids or the student, the young people's voices, um, you know, that's what I think is the hardest bit. And by the way, economists have nothing to say about that because we just blab away about co-creation, but we don't do that. Um, but, but that's what Camden, which does have an experience, and I'm working with Camden, learning from them, of bringing the voices to the table of the people that are, I guess, going to be benefiting from a program, but who says, you know, how they're going to benefit. So again, that idea of bringing the resident associations or um, students, uh, young people, 
uh, who are going to be using youth centers, they should be designing the youth centers that actually want to be go to a youth center as opposed <laughs> for it to be designed by one of us <laughs> or they won't come. Um, and, and again, on the youth center bit, it shouldn't just be coming back to the dichotomies in the beginning, yes or no, or we've cut the money, we have cut the money, and it is a tragedy, I think it's a crime, <laughs> um, but it should also be how do you really redesign them so that they're at the center of our economy, that's where the innovation occurs, that's where the, the seniors, that's where the data comments could go, I mean, the BBC archive, where does it sit, it should be sitting in public libraries, right? And, and by the way, what's on iPlayer is just like the last years or whatever, but we have archives, common data, where does this data sit? And so in the kind of reinventing and reviving the notion of youth centers, community centers, public libraries, it shouldn't just be, oh, fund them because otherwise, you know, it hurts people. It should be put them at the center, at the center of knowledge creation, of value creation, of wealth creation. And then who's going to be reviving and rejuvenating and, and reimagining them? Of course, the people who are using them. So the youth should be at the center of that process. Mariana, we, oh, we, I talk too we, much, it's crazy. We, 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 we've got time, <laughs> but we, we must let one, have one question oh. from the remote audience. Oh, yes, of course. Because they're the only ones who saw the slides anyway. So. <laughs> the titles. Why don't you tend to read it out? Okay. Uh, a question from online this evening is from Ayaka Kimura. Kimura. No. Apologies, Ayaka, but I can't pronounce your last name. Uh, they're from Japan. They're an ex LSE student. Um, and they have a question about the uh, big con for Mariana. Oh. Uh, they say that you mention about how consulting companies harm the public sector uh, and the necessity of the public sector's independence from those consulting firms. And he asks, what could the public sector do to, comp to uh, gain competitive human capital mm. when most of the high performance, uh, high performance uh, workforce tend to go to consulting where salary offers are much more attractive compared to the public sector. Yeah, so it's a chicken and egg problem. And I don't think it's just uh, salary, by the way, I gave, you know, sometimes people talk about the Singaporean public sector because they just earn a lot more than we're used to um, in, in some Western countries, but that's not what attracts people. It's not just salary. If you think of, I'm sure a lot of students in the room are not just thinking of money, even though it helps. Um, so we should definitely make sure that we are um, paying our civil servants uh, competitive rates. But what I think would really attract um, people, which is, I don't want to say that we don't have good people in the civil service, but what would actually change that chicken and egg problem is to have the remit, right, of the civil service um, and the narrative, the storytelling about it outside of this idea that at best you're redistributing, at best you're regulating, at best you're administering, at best you're de-risking, enabling, facilitating. You literally want to like fall asleep by the time you've said all these words. Even central banks, by the way, that saved the capitalist system from falling apart were called like lenders of last resort, right? It's, it's always like... <laughs> um, so... So the remit really matters, right? And that's why it requires a big rethink. This isn't about just tinkering on the sidelines. So that's one thing. I mean, um, th th that example I gave of, you know, a Nobel Prize winning physicist saying, yep, of course I'm there to help Obama, you know, direct the DOE because that DOE is going to be at the center of economic change. A, B, this is not about... Um, it's, it's, it's not about not having consulting, right? I mean, we're not saying everyone should go into the civil service. <laughs> Wouldn't be a bad result, actually. I mean, it'd be very cool if we actually had, you know, this amazing wave that went into government. But um, it's, it's actually about allowing also the civil servants to take the risks that the others are explicitly allowed to take. So what does that mean? Not so much for metrics and delivery units and, you know, that kind of efficiency, but actually being quite open that what we need are like gov labs, you know, laboratory. So I'm just using the word gov lab because I was just in Chile and they have a laboratorio de gobierno, which we translate as gov lab, but spaces within government, literally within the government that you're allowed to be a bit nutty. You know, when, when Steve Jobs gave that famous uh, talk to the Stanford graduating class, he said, to be innovative, you have to be hungry and foolish. Well, that's fine if you're gonna go into the private sector and that might be why you go to the private sector. You're allowed to be hungry and foolish, what does it mean to be hungry and foolish within the civil service, thinking about an all of government approach to well-being, uh, a real climate strategy that is about transforming an entire economy, how we produce, how we consume, how we distribute, providing that direction and then fostering that bottom-up experimentation 
but also maybe screwing up along the way. We will make mistakes, learning by doing, trial and error and error and error. You will not learn how to ride a bike if you can't fall off. Why do we think civil servants are gonna be able to do anything if they're not allowed to fall off and admit they fell off instead of hiding the data <laughs> that they fell off? Um, I was just talking actually at, at a Camden meeting we just had the other day on procurement. We're trying to help Camden do outcomes oriented procurement. And someone said something fascinating, which made me think actually I need to rethink a bit what I've been thinking, which is that when you have an outcomes orientation, the problem is that if your outcome, for example, is on obesity, right? And you want to eliminate obesity through some sort of policy, the number of things you should do are like 180. There's 180 factors. This is Toby Lowe, by the way, at the CPI up in, in Newcastle, in case he's listening in. So thanks, Toby, for telling me this. Um, there's 180 factors behind obesity, and yet the people in charge in an outcomes-oriented way in government don't have the levers on those 180 things. So what you actually want to do is, coming back to the seniors, making sure that they can bring together lots of different actors in the system who know about those 180 things, but have that outcome in their minds in terms of how they're working, sharing, distributing that kind of collective intelligence. So we have to be very careful with outcomes orientation in government because you're giving people the reason to basically just fudge the data because you're giving them responsibilities without the levers of knowledge and access to those 180. So they just not really make up the data, data, like they're not doing it on purpose, but it almost becomes what happens that the numbers almost get fabricated in order to deliver on an outcome that you have no power over. Oh, but I didn't really answer the question. What was the question? Oh, how do you, yeah, it sort of did because right, if you reverse all this and say to go into government is about shaping, creating value, fostering collective intelligence to solve the biggest wicked challenges of our time, not the wars, but the wicked challenges underneath the SDGs, it's exciting, right? You go in and of course we have to pay civil servants a competitive wage, but it's not just gonna be that that's gonna attract them in. Mariana, this has been absolutely incredible tour de force. Mm. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, <laughs> you, uh, suddenly you, you're really inviting us to try and rethink how mm. our institutions should be organized to deal with this whole amazing range of problems that you, mm. you talked about which is why we're really looking forward to finding more about it from you next time. Okay, So thank great. you so 